Okay, story time. Continuing on with the uh, the book, The Nature of Honour. Where is my mock-up? Here it is. And um, uh, we're in Northern Ireland now, getting a bit more gritty. <coughs> Chapter 16, Snakes and Ladders. The Barrett M82 0.5 caliber rifle was titled an anti-material weapon. That is, it looked like an oversized sniper rifle, but its purpose was not to shoot people, but soft-skinned vehicles such as Land Rovers. In essence, it was a cannon disguised as a rifle. It had a large telescopic sight. It could be aimed accurately from about two kilometres. This meant that if it was firing at you, you had no chance of being able to see the firer, and your only option was to seek cover until the danger had passed. It needed considerable skill and training to operate it properly, and no one expected it to be used against professional troops in Northern Ireland, any more than we expected to see the IRA piloting a helicopter. However, once the dreaded 50 cal, as it was known, made an appearance in the Northern Ireland Troubles, nothing felt quite the same again. It was a regular patrolling day, and when the British soldiers first heard the bang of the 50 cal going off, they thought there'd been a bomb blast. Looking around, however, they couldn't see the usual smoke cloud, nor were there any obvious casualties. While the exact details of what happened were sub subsequently suppressed by the army brass to avoid panic in the troops, the rumour grapevine was impossible to stop. According to the grapevine, the force of the 50 cal had not only sounded like an explosion, but a soldier who had been hit by the round had been stuck to the wall he was standing in front of by the heat of the explosion. No one even realised he was dead for a few minutes, as he appeared simply to be frozen. When he failed to answer the shouts of his teammates, they approached only to find he was very dead indeed. We didn't know it at the time, but it seems that the weapon had been fired not from a far off hilltop, but a relatively close delivery van with a hole cut in the back door, which could be resealed after the shot had been fired. The IRA's use of the 50 cal had the desired effect, and soon all British infantry units patrolling the streets of Northern Ireland lived in fear of being torn apart by this fearsome weapon, even without even knowing what hit them or where the enemy were. It was into this tense atmosphere that I arrived in Northern Ireland in the winter of 1992 as a platoon commander of the 2nd Battalion Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. I was reminded I was lucky in Armagh. It would patrol the city in platoon groups and I was given one section, while a fellow officer and his team were allocated the neighbouring streets. One day, after my platoon and I had returned to base, I was falling asleep when, bang, the building shook. I leapt out of bed, got dressed and ran outside to see what needed to be done. The whole platoon was out the gate in a business-like fashion barely five minutes after we'd been in bed getting ready to start dreaming. We filed out and patrolled towards the blast site. That entailed walking spaced out with rifles on our shoulders ready to fire, while slowly turning and moving backwards for a few steps every ten metres to check behind us and covering each other around the corners. Five minutes down the road, our radio operator got the signal, one NBS, that's no vital signs, which means dead, but we aren't admitting it. Three seriously injured, enemy unknown, prepare for a second ambush as you pr approach the position. I acknowledged the message and spread the troops out. They didn't need any micromanaging. They were a professional bunch with a good sergeant. The nuts and bolts were taken care of and all I had to do was make the big decisions. Ten minutes later we arrived in the area of the blast. 
ambulance and police force were there. They were used to this by now. We cordoned off the area, having seen no signs of enemy anywhere. As the officer on the spot, I gave a statement to the local TV crew, but simply confirmed the blast and the number of casualties. The rumour grapevine, which was always the quickest of all communications, confirmed that a corporal, a well-liked and athletic young guy, had died on the way to hospital. In a ruthless kind of way, we were relieved. As apparently he was in bits, and whatever life awaited him probably wasn't worth living. Not for someone who lived for sport, adventure, and doing something for their country. The concern was now for two things. Other casualties who were fighting for their lives and catching the perpetrators. My brother officer, the platoon commander, had also been badly hurt. His foot blown off. It was a sophisticated attack, the result of 20 years of bombs and countermeasures that had resulted in both sides being experts in their craft, one killing soldiers, one defending them. Not only were the soldiers attuned to the nuances of Northern Ireland after two decades, but we had the best possible intelligence service. Half the population supported us and hated those who didn't. On the other hand, the other half, even if they weren't actively fighting us, were certainly never going to lift a finger to help us. It was a bitter, prolonged war, as only they can be when people who live a stone's throw from each other and are alike in so many respects are at the same time involved in a titanic struggle against each other. We buried the corporal a week later after he died. It was a small, sad occasion, with only his company of soldiers there as well as his parents and girlfriend. We gathered in a little churchyard on the base with a flag draped coffin and his fellow soldiers in their uniforms. A piper, a piper played and then walked off into the distance, still playing the mournful tune while giving the impression of a spirit leaving the earth forever. I can only imagine what the effect the corporal's violent death had on his girlfriend. She might get over this, but the knowledge that someone she'd been intimate with and likely hoped to share a life with had been blown to pieces must have scarred her deeply. At least they didn't have children. This funeral summed up, for me, why integrity and military leadership mattered. Whatever the politics of the girlfriend, death made things personal. It was the same with any death of any soldier in operations. She would have been asking herself, did my partner die in the pursuit of something worthwhile? Or was his life wasted because of some short-term political pantomime? Later in my life, I'd have serious reservations about another war in which I found myself entrenched. In Northern Ireland, though, I genuinely felt we were serving a good cause in protecting the people. That will do it for tonight. Hope you enjoyed it.